Okay, let's go ahead and get started. If you are, these slides are not available, so it would be great if you'd like turn your machine off or down or away or whatever and pay attention to our guest lecturer. Uh, before I turn it over to Mohammed, I'd like to just make a, a comment about the calendar. It's, like it's been updated and things have been moved a little bit. So you want to really keep yourself abreast of what's happening there. You know, the snow day is really something to come around us. Um, we're likely to have another snow day this Monday, which will be another, another one that we don't know. I don't want to think about it. Uh, makes my life sort of a living hell. Um, Mohammed, who didn't used to be called that, but that's okay now. <laughs> He, he, he tried to confuse me. I mean, he used to use the K in the middle for Kabir, and that, I got used to that for years. But since then, he's gone back to his real first name. He uh, was a student of mine 12 years ago. So there is, there is proof that there's life after CCSU and, and MIS 410. Um, he's going to talk tonight about really how to query a client and pay close attention because when you do the bidders' conferences, okay, you're really going to be querying me. And you're required not to use any closed-ended yes-no type questions, but all open-ended questions, which makes you think a little bit harder. Um, <laughs> he's going to talk about client engagements and what that type of thing means. What you folks are really involved in is a simulated client engagement. Okay, you're trying to, at least the RSP portion of it. You're trying to figure that out. Almost there. Yeah, that makes sense. It works. It works for me. Okay. So I'm going to go sit. This is Mohammed Yousef. He'll do the rest of the introductory stuff, and I'm going to go in the back and sit. Uh, and he's going to late, but that's okay. And he's going to critique like he's been doing to me for the last 12 years. But uh, good, e good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I thank you for your time. I do appreciate it. Um, I do, you know, I look forward to these things because it's interesting. Whenever I come back to campus, I realize that, you know, this place really did add a lot of value to to what I've become uh, in my career, and uh, it's amazing to see how the program has developed. Uh, this building was actually built, I think, you know, two years before I graduated, and it's amazing to see how much uh, how much the technology has changed yet stayed the same. I believe you're still using the same Dell laptops and desktops that we used during that time. So, uh, you don't have the same one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, um, but I wanted to. Um, uh, when I was speaking with Dr. G, you know, one of the things that I wanted to talk to you guys about is, you know, how to kind of deal with um, with clients. Uh, in my role as a director of IT, um, one of the things we do is we do a lot of interfacing with with clients, um, responding to RFPs, rep responding to RFIs, going and working as consultants to help organizations use technology to alleviate their business challenges. Um, I've been doing this for quite some time now, and I think it's one of the the best things I've ever. I've ever done. Um, I'll take you through a little bit of an agenda, just going through some introduction on <clears throat> and my history, who I am, what I've done, um, how to identify the right side client, uh, question and answers, the next steps after meeting with the client, and then I actually want to go through a little activity and then actually show you guys one of the uh, assessments that we utilize in trying to help determine how we work with clients. Um, we work with a vast majority of clients at uh, Vicom. I've been at Vicom Computer Services now um, eight years. I'm a director of IT sales. I have ten consultants that work for me. Um, I was one of the head consultants for the last four years, actually number one within the organization in terms of bringing in projects. Um, I took the role of a director in October of 2012, no, 2013. October of 2013, only because I felt like I needed to do something else and I was getting bored. Uh, uh, so I figured, you know, Try to figure out a way to help the company out. Um, I've been leading a team of ten consultants, which vary from literally high school gra uh, college graduates from last year to people who have been in the industry for twenty some odd, thirty something years. Uh, as I stated previously, number one uh, consultant at the firm from twenty ten to twenty fourteen. Uh, my customers ranged uh, from big time insurance firms in New Jersey to big education um, and medical services. Uh, organizations in New York City. I was mostly focused in New York City. That's where I felt the life was. Um, took me a while to get there, but some of the products and some of the tools that we had allowed me to get to where I needed to be. Um, I did end. I did end up um, authoring a book in 2010, I believe. I think it's 2010. Um, off my MBA. Um, I received my MBA in 2009. I've been convinced by a certain guy in this room to do my doctorate. I'm in the process of doing it now. I won't point any fingers or elbows. Um, <clears throat> I'm in the process of doing my doctorate in information systems. Um, I'm in the, at the dissertation level, and I'm going to tell you that that's probably the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. Um, the coursework is a joke, means nothing, 
really ridiculous. When you get the dissertation, if you have a real life and you're trying to go to school, yeah, that's when it gets tough. So um, if you want to do it, do it before you develop a real life. Um, over 12 years of IT industry experience, um, I was an engineer to begin with. Um, I did try the programming thing. Uh, actually, I came into Central as a computer science major. Uh, and then I sat in front of a keyboard, blue screen, Java, uh, started programming, um, and I couldn't get the... I couldn't get any of the compi com compositions or compiling that I did to ever work. So I decided to stop programming. I figured it wasn't for me. Plus the fact that I didn't like to sit in front of a computer and just type all day. Um, made it really, really boring. I switched the M to MIS and uh, the rest is history. Um, I'm a professor at Monroe College in the Bronx as well, teaching information systems. So I've been around um, from engineering to, uh, to help desks to eventually graduate towards consulting. Um, I've seen a lot of things and one of the things I'll tell everybody is that as an MIS major, uh, you have a lot of places you can go. You can either be customer facing, client facing, or you can sit in the back and uh, do all the engineering work. It's all up to you where you want to go. Um, don't be afraid to stretch. Uh, I was I was certain that I was going to sit as an engineer for my entire career, but when I realized that I could start making the money for myself rather than helping somebody else make the money, um, yeah, jumped right outside and uh, it's been good ever since. Uh, that's my background. Um, I went through this program from 99 to 2003. Uh, the program, your project, the is it TSI, TSI project? I was one of the first students to do that project. Um, don't email me for any information because that project is completely different than what it is when we did it. We were caring more about the cost of CAT, CAT4 cables, CAT4 uh, Cat cables, CAT5 cables, CAT5E cables. Cat cables you know, trying to make them ourselves. My group actually decided that we were going to make the cables ourselves versus buy them online. Um, at that point, there wasn't really a lot of research or anywhere that we could go to kind of do anything. So um, today, you're dealing with cloud services and different things. So it's a completely different project, something completely uh, just, you know, it's a lot more fun. Um, so today, I want to take you through talking about identifying the right client. So, you know, here's some of the things that I want to kind of go through when you're when you're looking at a client. So, let's say we come into a situation where, you know, we're a consultant and we're being asked to gather information from a client. Many a times when you talk to people, the easiest thing when they don't want to talk to you, the easiest thing that they'll do is give you yes or no answers, right? But the only reason they give you yes or no answers is because you allow them to give you yes or no answers. You ask the questions that allow for a yes or no. Do you have any servers? What's the answer you're going to get? What's the answer you're going to get? How many servers do you have? Do you use virtualization? Do you have any storage? Right? These are questions that get you answers, but are those answers telling you anything about the organization? No, they're not. They're not giving you any insight. Because to develop a plan, you need to have some insight. To develop a plan, you need to understand exactly what the challenges are. With organizations, especially those that are not warm to you, it's like pulling teeth, right? You know when you don't want to give out information. You know when you don't want to talk to anybody. You know, you know, if you take a meeting, I've been in situations where, I've ta where an organization has taken a meeting with me, and the reason they took the meeting is because I'm friends with the CIO. They don't really want to deal with me, but to respect their CIO, they meet with me. And I'll tell you, it's the most gruesome 30 minutes of my life. They don't want to tell you anything. And how do you help somebody if they don't want to tell you anything, right? You need to figure out the best set of questions to ask your client. But before that, you need to identify the right client. So what makes the right uh, client? Size. Do you talk to everybody? Is that the right way to go about it? Right? Is an organization that has 30 users worth your time as a consultant? You tell me. Show of hands. Who would want to talk to an organization that has 30 users? Show of hands. You would? You would? Why? Why not? They could potentially be more later on down the road. It's part of the repeat business. Okay. Anybody want to counter that? The side of the room? So you would take, you're okay taking an organization that has 30 clients? Okay. I'm not. I'll tell you why. Ah, go ahead. It depends. That's exactly it depends what I was looking for. The type of organization, if I do business with the, the SMB, that's who I do business with, Correct. that's fine, but that's where my market niche is. Depending on where my market niche is. You, sir. Dwayne. 
Yeah, this kind of because I'm thinking about what if this organization has a conception of growing? I might want to keep that link right there just in case they explode it like a Google. Okay. And I'm in the back pocket. Okay. Yeah, yeah I mean, the professor said it all this, but I was going to say, but basically it matters what your specialty is. Right. You may, I mean, if you're going after 30 person in unit, you probably only have a, a couple IT staff there. So if you're going after a couple hundred of your client, you, know, you better make sure you have the technique to back on it, you know, back that up. But if you have a choice, why not go for a bigger one? So you make a lot more mistake with the little guy. They don't. Right. <laughs> so it all depend. It all depends on your market segment. Where we are at Vicom, the organization that I work for, we do not focus on the thousand users or less. We refuse. It's not worth our time. Our engineers are getting paid, hundred fifty, two hundred thousand dollars. You know, our pre-sales engineers. It's just not worth it. Right? That's a completely separate market. Right. We focus on the enterprise clients, the Aetnas, the Cigna's, the Hartfords of the world. Right. The Yukon Medical Centers, you know, Yukon Law. Those are the organizations we focus on, not the mom and pop shop. But I have worked for a firm that made its money strictly off of nonprofits and mom and pop shops. Right? It fit. So determining the right size client is based on your business and what you're looking for. There are some organizations that take everybody. Right? You lose more money as an organization working with the bigger accounts or the smaller ones. On what? So let's put it this way, right? A project, 100 hours, right? For an organization that's 30 users versus a project, 100 hours for an organization that's 1,500 users. Where are you more profitable? Pardon? What am I missing? What am I not telling you? What do you need to know to determine if it's more profitable? What kind of support? Rate, rate. Hourly rate. There you go. How much rate? Hi, bigger companies How much rate? can charge more. Right. It's the hourly rate. Forget, forget that first, right? Because let's say flat out our fee is $300 an hour, right? Where do you think I'm going to spend the most resources? At a small client or a bigger client? Careful how you answer. Careful how you answer. Where do you think you're going to spend the most resources? At a smaller client or a bigger client? Pardon? Show of hands if you think it's a bigger client. Show of hands, please. Where do you think you're going to spend? If, if my rate is $300 an hour, right, where do you think I'm going to spend the most resources? At a bigger client or a small client? Which one? Show of hands if you think bigger. Hands high so I can see them. Come on. Show of hands if you think smaller. So majority of the room seems to think bigger. Doctor, do you venture to take a guess? Oh, I, I know. No. You I venture to tell me? I know what happens. Smaller organizations tend to be less sophisticated and therefore require a lot more hand holding than larger organizations. They will suck you dry. They absolutely. They will absolutely milk you for everything because they're the ones that are going to calculate minute for minute the time you spend with them. Well, you sent me a bill for 100 hours or 300 hours. You said it's $300 an hour, but John was only here from 3 o'clock to 3.15. How do I get billed for an hour? I want my 45 minutes back. Now, not only are you sending engineers, but you're now asking your accounting team to now go back and deduct the 45 minutes. Who's cost you more? When in the bigger account, you've got technical engineers, you've got people, they're probably bringing you on as a consultant for an extra set of hands. They have the people that do the stuff. So they may not need you to be there. As a matter of fact, in the bigger account, you could probably charge for an hour and you're only there for 10 minutes. Yes? So Not that I've ever done it. I've done it. <laughs> I mean, five hours. I've done it. Right? When I consult, I have a minimum hour. Right. Most, most firms will have a minimum hour. But when you're dealing with these smaller firms, they're after you. They're checking everything. I've, done, I've been on both sides. Right? So... The right size account depends on who you are as a firm and what your practices are. Don't be so quick to take everybody. You have to establish from the beginning what your basis is. This is the type of account I'm looking for. If I count 1,000 users or greater, we do not work with anything less because we just don't have the bandwidth. Complexity. Right? Complexity. 
It's like Dr. G said, you can have some small account, you've got one wizard at a small account, nonprofit, that tells you that he knows everything, he doesn't need any help. And he's created the most complex environment just to print one sheet of document. Right? You've got to go out to this cloud and tap into this VPN and download it to that computer and then run over to that side of the room and hit start on the printer just to print one letter, one word. I've seen it. It's a, it happens. Right? Or... You could have a guy who has a very simplistic environment, right? And you can hack it in your sleep. Complexity, it matters. You have to gauge that. Do you want to deal with that? Is that something you want? Is that something you care about? Budget. Can they afford you? Can they afford you? Our rates are $225 an hour. Most people look at that and run the other way. But I also know what my engineers bring to the table. That's why I can be at $225 an hour. Right? That's why we do that. And account growth. You talked about that before. Right? What's the potential, Dwayne and uh, Jamil? You guys talked about that before. What's the potential for an account to explode? Right? You talk about Google. There are very few Googles in the world. Right? There are very few accounts that will explode. <clears throat> They have dreams and aspirations uh, that of, of wanting to explode, <coughs> but they never get there. Keep in mind, folks, when you talk about IT, IT is still viewed as an expense. We're still a cost center. Right? No matter which way you slice it or dice it, it, there are very few people within an organization that find value in us. I'll give you, a perfect, I'll give you one industry that will never find IT. And I believe, this is my personal belief. Right? Never say never. One industry that will never find IT other than a cost center, is law firms, legal. You want to know why? The cost of IT is tapping into per partner profit. So every time I got to shell out $100,000 for this piece of storage, I've got $100,000 out of the partner's profit. So that's why some of them have a depreciation life cycle of 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 years. Because the partner's wallet's got to get fatter before the technology gets better. And guess what? That same partner will be the first person to complain when anything's slow and not working. But will be the last person to sign the check. So I, I personally and none of my team deals with legal. Don't want the headache. It's not worth it. The most profitable industries? Healthcare. Medical. Hospitals, yes. Practice or, or big, no, big, 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 big not big private, private big, not private, big hospitals. Okay. NYU Medical, UConn. Why? Why are they the most profitable? Why Why are they the ones you want to target? Give me a reason. Somebody. Well, Matt. Easier access to medical records would save a lot of time and resources. That's one. I they say they're more dependent on technology. Why? With the medical records and the Okay, a spinoff of a spinoff of uh, healthcare insurance firms. Why are insurance firms top prime poaching customers? Why? Think about what's happening right now. Go ahead. Your name, sir? Rick. Rick. Uh, compliance. Part <coughs> of it. Alan. Why? Come on. Think about what's happening in the environment right now. What's happening? What's being mandated? <coughs> Pardon? Regulations. Yeah. Healthcare, right? They're forcing people to have health care. What does that do as an insurance provider? What now has to happen to your technology? New business, new clients, growth starts to happen, right? So you're going, your expansion of storage continues to grow. Because guess what? You're onboarding more patients. You need more records that you have to keep. Is that not the ideal place as a technology person? With Obama's health care requiring everybody to now have health insurance, do you not think that every single insurance firm is just piling up storage to store the data that they're getting? Right? Compliance is there. There's no doubt about it. I'm not arguing that. Security is there. There's no doubt about it. But think it through for a second. You've gone from having your steady state of maybe you know 100,000 in enrollment every time January comes around to now the entire country being mandated to have health insurance. That's new data every single member. Right? That's the tip of the iceberg. 
Let's say a member has several diseases or several family members or several claims. You're not talking spirals of data. Are they not the right size account? Yeah. To pick data from, right. to read these, the volume variety, um, the velocity, volume variety of data right. in healthcare is just exploding for the reasons that you're saying. Yeah. We, we had, I, I, I support one of the largest healthcare firms in New Jersey, right? This year alone, they had, I believe, 200,000 enrollees, right? Their data grew, was growing, we, the data was growing over the last four years at a 15 percent clip. That was just how much storage was growing. This year alone there was a 25 percent clip growth. Right? So an additional 10 percent was what the data grew. And they didn't have maximum enrollment because everybody still hasn't bought onto the healthcare. It's still coming. It's still, there's still droves and waves of it. Just imagine. Just imagine what happens. Right? All of a sudden you're just going to keep blowing up and blowing up and this is what happens. So when you're looking at this this is what, the size of the organization matters, right? The complexity matters, the budget matters, but the mo one of the most important things is account growth. How much business can you draw from this organization after your first initial conversation? What's the potential? What's the potential of this organization? Those are the things you have to look at. So let's look at questions and answers, right? These are just a few, and I'll take some from the class as well. Right? What are the right questions to ask? You need open-ended questions. Like I said, no yes or no questions. Don't do anything for you. So somebody, you come in, I'm with a healthcare firm, give me an open-ended question that you're going to ask me. Right? My main goal for the year, I need to address enrollment. I need to address enrollment. I've got, I'm, I'm anticipating projecting 250,000 new members. This side of the class is one consulting group. That side of the class is another consulting group. Please tell me, what open-ended question do you ask me? On the spot. On the front. I will ask you, what is your current data amount, and how much do you expect to grow over the next year, and how can we help alleviate you those concerns? First two questions, very good. Desiree. You're next, Elliot. That's how you smile. So think about it. Come on, as a group, tell me. He's asked, he says, right, his two questions. He wants to know what my current data size is and what my growth rate is. Matt, Andrew, Dwayne, Ashley, Dan, come on, your group, Ian. Go ahead. What's your current state like? Current state, similar to what he asked. Get out of here. Okay. So, what's the technical? That's a little bit bold. Yeah. That's not an open-ended question. Right. They've got, they've got finite answers. But it, it pulls... They don't get to the detail behind it. It pulls out information. It's the first step. It's a first yeah. step to pulling out information, right, to understanding where I'm at. You're not out of the woodwork yet. Yeah, no. No, right? You're not... some idea about what I can recommend. You... Recommend. No, no, never recommend. Never recommend. So he's made the, the, the cardinal sin of all rules as a consultant. Never recommend. Let them tell you what they need. Right? That's <laughs> right there. Cardinal soul. rule. Listen, listen, listen. Cardinal sin, as a consultant, you come in automatically, you're pitching this. Do this, do this, do this, do this. Problem solved. Cut my check. Sign my check. I'm out of here. Wrong. You will absolutely never be invited, at least back to my office. Well, at some point, they'll want a recommendation. Right? right. But you don't know any. You don't know anything. You just said to me, tell you my... My uh, my growth, my my story size, and my growth, right? And then you said to recommend. At some point, after I get more information. Right, but what other information? What other ma good question. I, I'm not. I'm not. Let me so throw this idea out there, okay? So I might ask rather than you know, what's your yeah. size. I might say something along the lines of, um, could you describe what you anticipate your size to be and what your plans are to accommodate that? That brings the dialogue. Right. The other brings the number. Right. So that could be your primary question. Your secondary question could be what you asked, right? So now you understand where they want to go, but you know where they're starting, right? So you need that. Anybody else from this side? Andrew. 
What are you lacking in resources in terms of manpower? Yeah. So, I mean, obviously, they're bringing out a consultant firm, so we must have some in place where they're supplementing what they have. Okay, but uh, how does that open up dialogue? Well, that kind of gets you up in how, you know, like how much you need to bring, how many manpower you need to bring. How about being more specific to the specific project, right? How many resources do you have? What projects do you have that are associated with, yeah. right? And where do you feel that you need more help, yeah. right? Or better yet, the bigger question, what other projects do you have lined up? And what is your time frame to achieve them? And where do you need the resources? Right? Again, what you want to do is it has to be a bi-directional conversation. Right? It has to be bi-directional. It can never be just you talking. Right? You pose one question and you get three paragraphs out of it. Andrew, give me another question. Spot. Sorry, buddy. Ryan. Come on, guys, give me another question. Yes, Ashley. Like what the budget is? Yeah, that gives us a number, and? That was all I Matt. Let me just throw this other idea out, yep. okay? Each of your groups has five questions in the spirit of time, okay? You don't want to burn them on questions that are going to get you a finite answer. Same thing with a client engage. You can win. You got a half hour to talk to a team. You don't want to burn that half hour on finite it's answers. You want to get as much information out of each response as you can. Keep in mind, and, I, and I'll go to what the next steps are after this. Keep in mind, folks, when you ask these questions, it's so that you can develop a final proposal and a solution. Right? You may not get another chance, right? especially in an RFP. Right? If you're doing an RFP, they issue the RFP on Monday. They tell you you've got two weeks to ask questions. After those questions are done, you're done. There's no other chance to go back. So you have to be careful with the questions. So we'll come back to that, uh, to that first one. So discussion-based, <coughs> right? Which kind of ties into the first one, open-ended. You want to get into a discussion with the customer. You want to understand why you're here, right? Kind of like you talked about, manpower, resources, what direction. You want to ask very business-based questions, right? What are your goals, right? What are the pain points you have? What are the challenges you hope to alleviate? IT. Somebody, I'll tell you right now that, you know, enrollment, we're anticipating enrollment to go up by 20%, right? We're not certain we have the manpower to address enrollment. We have lots of applications that need to be spun up, right? And we need to make sure that we're compliant with all the new client members we're bringing on, right? That kind of gives you an understanding. Bare bones. doesn't really give you a lot. The other thing that you, you could find out is you talked about budget, right? That's very financial. But understand what they're doing with the budget, right? Why they're bringing you on. Is there room in the budget for you? Most of those discussions, though, come after you've gotten through the initial proposal. You never want to attack the money first. You attack the money, you're out the door. Fact finding. It's a fact finding mission. That's really what this is. Right? You're looking for clues to help unravel a puzzle. Most IT people, you know, the savvy ones will tell you they don't have any problems. Right? They'll tell you they don't have any problems. One of the questions that I love to ask these days is, are you familiar with what happened to Sony? Everybody's like, oh, yeah, it's horrible, man. It's terrible. Do you know that that could happen to you? Oh, no, that could never happen to me. Why couldn't it happen to you? What's your plan? What have you prepared to make sure it doesn't happen to you? Do you see how that can lead to a whole conversation? Right? Does it make sense as to how that can lead to a whole conversation? You've asked them, okay, it couldn't happen to you. Why? What, you know, what have you done proactively to make sure that you're not going to be hacked, your patient data is not going to be out there, you're not going to be sued, you're not going to lose your job? I'll give you a perfect example with the same customer that I'm talking about. The senior director of IT all of a sudden picked up uh, a Mac laptops to be under his group. <clears throat> Didn't worry about security for the first two, three weeks. One of them got stolen and the patient data was floating out there in the, uh, in the internet. And they got fined $800,000. And he lost his job. A right, good friend of mine lost his job. And when we asked him, he said, I just didn't know. I didn't think about it. It wasn't, it wasn't there. Right? You always have to be prepared. And that's what your job is, is to try and find those questions and find those loopholes to make sure that they are prepared. That's what they're paying for. 
So what to look for, right? Listen, listen, listen. Take as many notes until you get as much writer's cramp as possible. Because the more information you get, the better your proposal is. Right? Repeat the client's needs. Right? You always want to regurgitate what it is that they've said to have clarity and to be certain that you're on the same page. Nothing is worse than a client telling you something and you bring in a proposal and they're being completely opposite of what they told you. It's the most embarrassing thing and it tarnishes your reputation. Any questions? No? So next steps. Gathering the information from the client. As you talk to the client, you need to pay attention to what it is that they're telling you and what it is they're not telling you. You need to have questions that are going to draw as much information as possible. Right? You need a question that creates a, a spanning tree. Right? One question gives you this, and then from there you can span down to another question, and then another one, and then another one, and then another one. It's got to be a spanning tree. It can never just be closed. Once it's closed, you're lost. Right? The more information, the more crisp your proposal is. Discuss with your technical team on options, right? Once you gather the information, you come back. If your technical team is not with you or if they're with you, what are the options? Right? You always want to give client options. There are many ways to skin a cat. Some clients are terrible. You don't want to give them options. You just make the decisions for them. But that comes from knowing the client. You need to have an understanding of what the best way is. And as a consultant, what makes Vicom so good at what we do is we're vendor agnostic. We don't care if it's IBM. We don't care if it's NetApp. We don't care if it's VMware. We don't care if it's EMC. We don't care if it's HP. It doesn't matter. What matters is how do we solve this problem? Right? How do we solve this problem? We had a customer who was moving from one data center to the other data center. Right? They had two options. One, physically move all 1,500 servers from... Staten Island to Secaucus in New Jersey. Or figure out a different way to do it. So we went in and we asked the questions. Right? First question was, what's, causing, what's the reason for wanting to make this move? Why are you deciding all of a sudden in the middle of the year, middle of your academic year, that you wanted to make this move? Where is this coming from? What's the driving force behind this? The response we got <clears throat> was a reduction in cost because it was getting too much to be at the other data center. Secondly, space. There's no more space in the other data center. And thirdly, and probably the most important, that data center was shutting down in about a year. Three very important facts, no? Okay. So reduction in cost. How much are you currently paying? And why are you paying this? What exactly are you getting with what you're paying? So the director of IT then opened up. Well, we get you know 24 by 7 support. We get you know uh, it's a it's a it's a knock. We get a knock with it. We get hands and feet on the ground. We get free VMware licenses. We get as soon as he said free VMware licenses, the light bulb went off. I said you get free VMware licenses. Yes. Okay. How many of you are familiar with VMware? Virtualization. Someone. Right. Whole purpose: you take a physical server. You spin it off into virtual, allows you to move it any which way you want. So in a nutshell, what it is. The minute he said that, what do you think I'm thinking? Live migration. Pardon? Live migration, maybe? Straight migration. Right. I'm not moving those physical servers. Because I'm not taking the outage, number one. It was for a hospital. Right? Secondly, I'm not taking the risk. I'm driving down, and I'm cruising. Whoosh, drive off a cliff, servers end up in the ocean. I don't have insurance for that. Right? The easiest way to alleviate that risk is by listening to what he told me. Free VMware licensing. So we thought about it. How do we architect this solution? Okay, do you have a disaster recovery site now? Yes, they do. They have one. Do you use it often? No, we don't. What do you have on that side? They couldn't tell us anything. So we said, okay, here's what we think you could do. You've told us this much, you have a disaster recovery site. Our thoughts and process is take whatever you have with your free VMware licenses, virtualize it. 
Take that, port it over to the disaster recovery site. Keeping you running still. Physically shut these servers down, create another virtual environment at the new data center, port that over, and you're up and running. That was our solution. Right? Keeping everything, and everything scheduled within a window. But if I never asked him, if I stopped it, oh, we're paying too much, and I never asked, well, what's included in what you're paying to create a dialogue, I wouldn't know about the licenses, would I? I wouldn't have figured out the solution so quickly. That's why I said it's very important to listen when you ask the questions. Prepare for a follow-up meeting with your technical team. Once you get the proposal sorted out, you bring it onto the table, and you have to have the discussion with the customer. Because there's certain things that you might have in there that they don't want to do, or they don't have the capability to do, they don't have the manpower to do. You have to have that discussion. And lastly, finalize and develop the proposal. And you have to be crisp in your presentation of the proposal. You have to explain why. Again, one of the things you want to deal with when you're working on the proposal is you want to regurgitate the challenges that they have, the pain points that they have, and how you are going to alleviate those pain points using whatever technology that they have currently in, in mind. Questions? Comments? Okay. We're going to take this half of the room in this half of the room, we're going to break you up into two groups, right? Here's the activity I have for you guys. Gender Incorporators, reach out to central consultants to come in and discuss two initiatives they're pursuing for the 2015 plan. Initiative one, disaster recovery, that's this group. Initiative two, security, that's this group, right? Break you up into two teams and your objective is to develop the right set of questions to ask the customer and help determine what exactly they're trying to achieve. No execution plan is needed to be developed, just the right set of questions asked and gathering of information. I need 10 solid questions that are going to pull information out of me. No yes or no questions. So let's go. We've got about 10 minutes, and then we'll spend the last 20 minutes of class doing the presentation. All right? Come on. Let's go. You guys can start. Get to work. I'm not nice if I'm down here. I'm not there. I'm actually launching one of our. Do you have a current center? It is a wild based so do you have a, okay. uh, and literally there's no reason to be so on the media infrastructure? You should use the creative sheet or create the instance in the cloud. Are you already creating the cloud? Probably. Let me know if it's an RDP. Oh, and I'm not sure. And let, and let, let me know sure. if it's RDP. Then, so how do you then address the organizations that's already invested in Citrix? And GM on the front end, right there. Can you back end to that? Can you back end IP to that? Yes. That's the question. You know, then it is your investment is not lost because. Well, but, I mean, data centers are shrinking. Right. And people have got to understand that the invest, you know, the investment, um, it's, uh, it's a new concept that we never discussed back in 410, but we discussed here in 410. Yeah. It's this idea of total cost of ownership versus total cost of operation. Well, but there's TCOP, which is, which is my thing. Okay, which is when you move into the cloud, you change the CapEx, OpEx mix, okay, to an operational expense. And the expense is more curious rather than appreciated for here. Okay, this is the place to go with the lawyers and the private practice and the doctors because we're paying a little bit each month and we're paying for big infrastructure costs. Right, okay? So this virtual desktop infrastructure is going to allow you to already be in from anywhere. But here's, so here's what's happening, what I'm seeing. So now you've got organizations that are really private and public. You know, they're building, building private clouds in the office. AWS. Well, private cloud can be somewhere else. The location right. doesn't matter. It, 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 what AWS has now done in a bunch of the other 
uh, oh, providers. Is, whole bunch of so you've yeah. got Nutanix, which is a storage provider, which allows you to build your virtual instances, right? But then yeah, you can push them off. Physical, like he said, where they had the bottom line is that the delivery of IT stuff is changing. What's up, buddy? So we're not being called into a company and they've asked us to do more and more. Not <laughs> solutions. You're asking questions to figure out what the hell they want to achieve with disaster. We already know they want that. Yes, we do. We know that. No. You know that's what you know it's a disaster. I've been writing it's, it, it's changed. It has to change. But, but, but what, I'm, what I'm seeing is we're going what from the CapEx right to a disaster. We are in the value proposition. So that's what we're not grappling. No, nobody, you know, you have to, nobody wants to hold the device. What do you want to do? Absolutely. So they what is your idea? What are you trying to achieve? Because I want to. I'm curious about how do you address Really Okay. But part of that I'm also doing is the rest of the um, AWS platform are you looking for the other main I deleted it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Keep in mind, people, you want me talking when you ask these questions. Don't give me an answer that will make me say yes, no, or one line. You need more. There should be a spanning tree effect with these questions, right? If you ask me something and I answer, it should be a follow-up question. It should draw something out. Yeah. Every disaster. Every bloody disaster. So it's been on question. What is the current All right, Todd. My three minutes. Um, all right. Again, we go back. All right. I, I, I caution you guys when you're doing this and when you're asking the questions. Keep in mind. Say you're responding to an RFP, they may give you a limit of questions. You want a spanning three, three question. You don't want to ask a question that somebody else is going to ask. You don't want to ask a question that just, you know, ends, stops at a dead end. You want something that's going to get people talking. So don't ask me, you know, what type of disaster am I trying to prevent against? Because I'm going to tell you, every damn disaster that exists in the world. Boom! Wasted question. Make sense? So, which group wants to go first? Awesome. This side. I have my hand. Dan. Just want me to read it. <clears throat> ah, well, is that how you're going to run it? Is that? All right, then I don't want to work well, with no, them. No. They're already fired. Oh, oh, Next oh. group. Oh, no, you guys ready? Oh, you're not ready either? Everybody's fired. This is easy. I can bring in another group. Tell me about your company and your disaster um, recovery issues. So, we are <laughs> X, Y, and Z Incorporated, right? We are the largest producer of biomedical um, materials in the world. Um, we currently now have no disaster recovery. Okay. <laughs> what would be your goals and objectives for... A disaster recovery plan such as what would your recovery time objective be to recover your infrastructure? <laughs> well, that's a good question. Uh, very good question. We don't we currently don't have a disaster recovery plan. What we'd like to do is be able to have not only disaster recovery but business continuity as well. Allow our people to Able, allow our information to be available to our people and for our people to be able to access them within a very short span. I would say four hours to get us back on track would be what we're looking for, and that's for our people to be able to get back to working. Okay, great, thank you. 
Um, what would you do you have, and obviously use different applications in your organization, maybe ERP applications or email, do you have different levels of priority to um, respond and get systems back up and running in a different type of order? Yes. Okay. Um, what would be the highest priority? The different applications you have, which ones do you have in your organization, and which ones would have a higher priority than the others to get back up and running? We have 10 applications. Financial has the highest priority. Okay. What other applications do you have in the organization? You're on question four, sir. I'm on question four? Yeah. My last question I believe I asked was what were the applications? Right. Okay. Okay. So I've got financial, people soft. I've got, I think you're on question four. I've got financial, people soft. I've got email, which is Outlook. I've got Oracle databases. I've got DB2 databases. I've got WebSphere instances. Um, yeah. But the most important is financial. People need to get paid. Fair enough. Um, so you have no disaster recovery right now. Where is your... Wait, 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 Tana. Is this guy speaking for the whole group? Is this how this is working? That's fine. Is anybody... I'm not... No, no, no objection. Is anybody else going to talk? I heard everybody contributing. But is this your man right here? Mr. No, no Badge. He sits over here. No name tag. I don't even know what his name is. Mark. Mark. That's who's representing. I have no problem. Go ahead, Mark. Continue. No, that's a, that's no, no. Continue. I don't so, so, so do you have a so you have no disaster recovery plan do you have in mind a location or region? Alaska. No. Okay. <laughs> what is your current resources in your organization to deal with disaster recovery and how do you think we can help you alleviate your issues in I don't have a plan. I don't have resources. That's why you guys are here. Okay. I'll do a Five dollars. <laughs> My budget for what? Um, I don't know. I'm looking for what you have to offer. What would be the time frame for implementation and design of this project for you? And what priority would you put based on the cost? Better question. Much better question. Don't ask me about my budget. I just scolded her for asking me about my budget. Um, we're looking to get this done between the next 24 to 36 months. Right. We need to have this op fully operational and tested within the next 24 to 36 months. Okay. Um, that's all the questions we have. Anybody else? You guys probably had two really good questions. Thank you. Which ones were they? We'll come back to them. So what do you need secure? Everything. Such as? Desktops, laptops, servers, everything. Do you have any current plan right now available for them? Nope. No current plan? Nope. Right what, poses bigger, what poses a bigger threat for you? Are you looking for internal or external uh, risks? Or what are you worried Both. about? What is, uh, what is your current compliance concerns? Do you have any current compliance concerns with the government that you need to worry about when it comes to your security? I want to be uh, all the compliance that's in my industry. That's what I want. I want to fill all the compliance that's in my industry. No, I told him. Buy a medical. Oh, okay. Yeah. So help us. Uh, yeah. <laughs> now, do you have any particular personnel or people that need require access for certain things Stop. at a certain level? I don't like your questions. Okay. There are you gotta, two. You've got to follow up on the hip thing. Okay? Bingo. Oh. I just, I just told you. I didn't hear listen, listen, so listen to me. They're not. Sorry. They're not doing direct patient contact, are right? you? Listen to me. I just listen. said I'm in biomedical. The number one thing that the next question you should ask me is what compliance, right? Is it HIPAA, right? There, then you have me, and I have to explain to you that I need to be. This compliance for HIPAA, I need to have patient records can't get out. Now that goes back to your internal and external question, right? You then can follow up and say, okay, then external is very important because patient data can't get out. But is it internal as well? Because I can't have the janitor having access to patient records. You got me where you wanted me, but you backed off. Do you guys see? Like, you have to. This is what I said about the spanning tree. He had me. He had me right where he wanted me. Right, because compliance is what he needed to ask. As soon as he asked me to comply, you dig into the compliance. We talked about security. People don't care unless it happens to them. Right? Your job is to try and prevent me. You had me where you wanted me to be. And now that would have I would have used that as my third question, and the fourth question being, okay, so then which is more important? Internal or external? Security. Both are. Right? Because I don't want 
John, the janitor, having access to patient data, but I also don't want somebody on the outside having access to it, right? Another question you could ask off of that is, okay, so you say you don't have any security plans. Is production data external or internal, right? You ask me that question, and I can answer, I can answer to you and say, place is falling apart. I can say to you that it doesn't matter. Well, yes, it does matter. Because one of the things you can say we can advise you based on our history is that you keep production data internal and develop security around it. Right? You have to you build a spanning tree when you ask these questions. There are guys that are a lot tougher than me. They just sit there like this with their coffee and just not and do exactly what I did. Say no, yes, no, maybe. No, but I'll do it bit of confidence. Right? Right? Just you know. no, yes, maybe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, if you ask me a question that's got a finite answer, the ball you're going to get. I will, I will, I've done it. it. Just, I'll just say no. And then you're going, okay, and then it rattles you. Because what they do is, they do exactly what they do, go like this, and then, and come back and say no. Right? You have to be prepared. The, and the way you get prepared is, you have to anticipate the answers to the questions. You think about it that way. It's very easy. You guys have read this stuff, you've seen it. If you follow any of the magazines in, in our industry, you kind of have a sense of what's next to ask. You have to set it up. Keep going. Give me another one of those bad questions. I'm just oh, 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 oh. Uh, so currently, the way your data is structured uh -huh. is in. Well, that was one of our questions. Skip it. Asked. Uh, and they're done. Spent. Much Guys, Time this frame is, obstacles, that's pretty much what it was. Same. This is, it's not an easy thing. The first thing you want to do is ask, an, ask a question that just comes right to your thought process. It requires you to be critical in the way you're thinking. I know you don't like to use that. Right? In the method in which you're thinking, you have to, it's got to be level. I talk about span. Does everybody understand what a spanning tree is? Yes? No? Let me explain. Here's one level. Span to the next one. Span to the next one. Span to the next one. Span this way. Span this way. Span this way. It's a spanning tree, right? Your folders in your and your subfolders, right? If you look at it in your directory, you've got a spanning tree. That's how you've got to play the questions. You've got to set up the next question, right? You're talking about disaster recovery. You asked me about location. Location means nothing. Right? That's why I gave you Alaska. Location doesn't matter in this day and age with technology, with cloud, with everything. Does it really matter where the data is? It realistically, does it really matter? Right? As long as it's not sitting on some server in the Middle East where I could be concerned that I couldn't get it, then I'm okay. Right? But reality is that question doesn't matter. Recovery time objective matters. RTO and RPO matter. Recovery point objective. When do you want to be back to? Do you need to be back to within the hour or can you survive on four days? How long can you take an outage? And why? Is that a compliant related thing? Or is that a business challenge related thing? Recovery time objective, recovery point objective are questions that will get people talking. Right? Those are what matter. And I've already told you about the HIPAA. Right? Compliance. It'll force people to talk. They have no choice. What, what stage are you at? Right. So okay. So you're in the biomedical. You're in the biomedical field. You're HIPAA compliant. Where are you right now? When was the last time you were audited? And what were some of the follow-ups from the audit? That is a question that burns anybody because they have to tell you what happened. Right. Everybody gets audited. Right. Same thing on you guys on your side. Have you ever been audited? Have you ever tested your disaster recovery? And what were some of the follow-ups that came up for it? Can we have access to it? Can we see it? Can we hear it? Boom. You force a conversation. It's not an open-ended question at that point, right? Did you find that, did you meet your recovery uh, point objective or recovery time objective? If not, by how much did you miss it, right? What challenges, what, what were you facing that forced you to miss it? Conversation, discussion, that's what you want. All that information gets put together, and then you build a proposal. And that's how it works, ladies and gentlemen. Questions? Comments? Yes, sir? You sounded like a uh, sales guy that I do that. You're always a sales guy, aren't you? <laughs> Remember, in the TSI problem, right? 
you have to sell your solution. So you've got to ask the questions that allow you to gather the data so you can build and sell a solution. You're all about creating value proposition. The technology is secondary or tertiary. Does it matter? There are no technical solutions. There's only business solutions that require technology. And at first mistake, every single IT person makes, you're focused on what technology you're going to sell. Rule number one, value. What is your value? Your intellectual property is your value. Your solution is your value. What you can do to alleviate the business challenge. Keep in mind, technology is not what we're doing. We're using technology to solve a business challenge. That's it. Forget about uh, this hardware, that. You're selling the value that your intellectual property and your firm's intellectual property brings. That's what matters. That's what they sign the checks for. That's why Accenture exists. That's why Open Sky exists. That's why all those consulting firms exist. They pay the brains. It doesn't matter. We can source the technology from anywhere. That's, that's irrelevant. You're, you're earning 60%, 80% on a consultant versus 12%, 14% on physical hardware. So yes, I do sound like a sales guy because I'm selling you something. I'm selling you me and my technology. Any other questions? Dan, Ian, Elliot, Kevin? Let me throw this idea out yeah. and then maybe this will generate some questions. Um, now, TSI is a project that the cement is being run like a real bidding situation. In a bidder's conference, there's usually very little at any time for follow-up questions. So, I mean, I've done many of them over the years. I'm asked to submit my five questions, that's, that's all I get, and they take the five questions from everybody that's bidding, and they put them together, and they combine yeah, them, answer. and then they answer them. Yep. But there's no follow-up. It's an answer. Because if I get 25 questions, I better get at least 20 usable questions. In an hour and 15 minutes, I'm going to take that long to answer those questions. There's not going to be any time in that bidder's conference. Companies aren't there for you to build that spanning tree in real time. They want to have the questions in advance so they can have the answers to the questions, so that they can be ready for that conference. But bidder's conferences are well-defined time blocks. Now, I, I, I've done, I'm doing three in this course, okay? That's unusual. Typically, it's one. It's a limited number of questions with one bidder's conference. I'm going to give you the opportunity to build, and we're going to build a focus around these bidder's conferences, right? So the first one will be about uh, deliverable A, the second one about deliverable B, the third one about deliverable C. So I'm going to give you the opportunity to ask the questions. So you get a lot more than five or ten questions. You'll get 15 questions. Okay, so I added that third conference because I really felt like it was necessary for your learning. That's why I did that. But what Mohammed is talking about is really, I mean, when, you, when, you, the span, when you're doing the spanning tree type thing in real time, that's a consulting engagement. Okay, where you're interacting with the customer and they're paying you $300 an hour to come in and you're talking to the customer. Do it all the time. Not a big deal. This is a competitive bidding situation, so it's a little bit different. Okay, and when you think those questions through, what you said was so perfect, you need to work from the answers to the question. What am I really looking for by asking that question? Okay, so if I want to know whatever this body of stuff is, then how would I ask the question to get the responses that I really need to know? Okay, so you've got to sort of outline a little bit those responses so you can ask the right question. Anticipate the response. You guys are intelligent enough to know that. Oh, Anticipate. Right, yeah. Anticipate the response. Right? And then say to yourself, what's the common response you get? You don't need to be in a director's position to know that. If the response is not sufficient, then you know you got to figure out a different way to ask the question, right? I've been involved in RFPs and bidders conferences. There is no chance. You've got everybody, every bidder puts in all their stuff. It comes in a bucket. You get a response back. Right. If you put the questions in a manner that forces an answer that they don't expect, they respect you, and most likely you will get a call back because... Those questions aren't answered by the procurement person. You know what they do with your questions? They take them and they slough them up to IT and tell IT, give us the answer to this. Right? If you get the IT person thinking, chances are you got to show. Any other questions for our guest? Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay. One more thing, the folks in 460 have already heard.